What's good team? Welcome to another Small James Coding tutorial where today we're going to be talking about React anti-patterns that commonly differentiate junior developers versus senior developers. It's all about code quality and so we have six different examples that you'll want to start incorporating into your workflow to make sure you're writing code like a pro. If you enjoy the video please like and sub and consider hitting the notification bell. Let's get into it. So the first anti-pattern is regarding props and component tree. And so here we have a React application and we have a singular component, a menu component, and we have two state variables which we pass down as props to the child component. Now this particular notation is all well and good, however in the actual subcomponent, the menu component, here we receive the props and then we render out the value of one of the particular props onto the screen. And this is commonly seen all over the place and it also represents our first anti-pattern. The best practice way for rendering items or at least or even handling variables in the subcomponent is to destructure them from the props input and then we can actually just remove the props input altogether and you'll see this renders out the exact same content on the page and there's actually one more upgrade to make this as tidy and efficient as possible and we're actually going to copy this out leave this as props and we're actually going to destructure our variables on this first line here equals props and this is the best way to pass and receive props between components because we can see all of the variables that we have destructured in our component we don't have to go writing props dot something everywhere and the final reason why this is better than just having that written in there is that if we have a secondary component, let's say we have a div and in here we have a sub component like that. If we wrote it in the original syntax, we would have to once again go through and say banana is equal to props dot banana and so on and so forth. That's going to take ages if we have a lot of props. If we do it the second way, we're still going to have to just write banana is equal to banana and repeat that process for every prop that we need to drill down. And if we have to pass all of them down, it's still going to be complicated. However, if we leave this props here and destructure on the first line, we can actually just use a shorthand syntax and spread the props just like that. And now we can really easily pass props through two or even three layers of component tree. We don't have to use the props keyword and it all looks very tidy. We know exactly what we expect in each particular component. So for our second anti-pattern, we now have our count displaying on our screen and we have a button that increments the count. Now, firstly, this is actually a two-part anti-pattern. It is definitely not best practice to actually have an anonymous function passed down in the JSX. Instead, what you're much better doing is defining a function up here. We could call it increment just like that and here we can say set count is count plus one so now what we could do instead is swap all of this out and just call increment just like that and so now it works exactly the same and the syntax is much cleaner but what if we wanted to increment by a particular amount let's say n and we have a variable here now we can't actually just increment this by three that syntax is not going to work because this is going to get executed on page render over and over. So instead what we would have to do is come back to this syntax and now we can see that if I change this to n, we get increments by 3. However, we're back to writing the syntax using the anonymous function. And the resolution for this to write code like a pro is to use what's known as a curried function. And so instead what we do is we return the anonymous function up here and we call the set count in the returned anonymous function and then this whole increment function is carried and we can consequently remove this arrow function just up here and we'll notice that that syntax works and we don't have to have the anonymous function in our JSX. Now for our third anti-pattern we have two inputs and each of them is correlated to a particular use state variable and so if I add an email I can have banana muffin at gmail.com and I can have a password or whatever that may be and here I have two particular on change functions as you can see and I've already broken a rule of one of the anti patterns that we've already talked about which is having these anonymous functions inside of your JSX but the main anti pattern here is we can actually remove a use state by defining a user and consequently set user function like that is equal to use 
state and we can set it as an empty object and maybe we have an email set to an empty string and consequently a password. And this particular syntax here is just a great way of reducing the amount of variables that we have if we're passing them down a number of props or anything like that. And so now that we've updated our state, we can consequently define a function called set email. And that just takes an event and is equal to set user. And we just spread the current user and update the email specifically to be e.target.value. And we can do exactly the same for set password, set pass just like that. And now we can pass these functions down so we can replace all of this and likewise replace all of this so we have no more anonymous functions in our syntax and that has temporarily broken it because we also have to update the values to use user.email and user.pass. Now we get it back and we can consequently save all of our values. However, that is not working because that should be pass. So now we have a username and a password just like that. No more functions in our JSX, but most importantly, we have defined only a single use state variable which is going to be much easier to pass down into a menu component, for example, far fewer props and less use state calls. Now for the next anti-pattern, we're gonna be looking at use effect. And so we can define a use effect like this and create the dependency ray in here. And now let's say in this use effect, we have a whole lot of console.logs for different variables. Let's say I have hello, and I can spread that a whole bunch of times and it's representative of a whole bunch of things. And maybe in here, what I also do is console.log user.email and maybe I add a console.log user.pass. So now I have this use effect and the last thing we're gonna to have to do is pass in user to make sure that it tracks the changing of the user state. Now our console.log looks like an absolute mess and it just gets even worse if I start adding in all these values. We can't tell what is happening. And so what every good developer would know to do is to go console.group just like this and then at the end call console.group end. And now what's going to happen is when I refresh this page, every time the variable changes, we can see that we can expand and contract these console groups, but we can also see that a particular console group is representative of this set of logic. And so now we can correlate these consoles to a particular render, which especially if you're using use effect, you can get a whole lot of them and it can be absolute chaos. So just wrapping all of the console.logs in this group can be a great way of congregating them together and just make your logging much easier to read. Now for our fifth component here, what I have is some conditional rendering where the component tree that gets rendered onto the page is dependent on some truthy statements. So the status of the user email and the sub components are just here. So we have the sub page, the private dashboard and the dashboard. And for these conditional displays, we can see that they update. So if I change that to hello, now we get the dashboard. And if I change this to pass, we see that we get the private dashboard rendering. However, this particular syntax down here is just not very clean, clear, and easy for a user to understand. So another common syntax used to achieve the same effect is let's say let body equal two. And what someone might just do is copy all of this and just paste it up there and consequently render it out as body down here. So that will have the exact same effect. So if I move that, we get the sub page and it almost becomes a sub component, but not quite. Now this is definitely cleaner. However, it is still an anti-pattern because it's not the best practice. The best practice for rendering out these conditional displays is instead to use an object literal. So what we could do here is say const content to render is equal to an object and in here we could have a key that says hello uh, and if it's and the associated content is the dashboard then we can have a secondary key and maybe that's pass and here we would render out the private dashboard just like that and finally we might have sub page 
So that could just be banana. And now we would render out the sub page just like that. And instead what we would do is replace the syntax up here. And so now what we can do is just have some conditional syntax down here that says user dot email in content to render and we can just render out that particular element. So content to render for user dot email. So now if I write hello up here, we can see that the dashboard is displayed. If I have banana, we get the sub page. And if I have the password, we get the private dashboard. And suddenly this is much easier to read and the syntax is very clear and all cases are covered. Now for our very last and final anti-pattern, we are going to be looking at data fetching using a use effect. And so because just here we have an empty dependency array, that means this use effect is gonna run on page load. And I've also defined three stateful variables that we will use to assign properties from our data fetching from. And so in here, you might be used to seeing something like async function fetch data, calling that, loading that here, and then calling that particular function. And inside of here, we might have a try catch and finally block, where here we set the loading to false. Here we set the error to the error.message. And in here we might have some syntax that says const res equals await fetch. And we pass in a particular URL. And consequently, const data is equal to await res.json, perhaps. And finally, we might set data equal to data just like that. Now this particular syntax is fine and this fetch data call is going to be made on the page load which is going to execute this function here and then what we could finally do is render out that information down here. However the best practice is to come into your source folder and create a react hook that is particular to this data fetching exactly and so we can just go here and make a new file called use fetch data.js and in here, we can create a functional component just like that. We can copy this entire use effect, including these three stateful variables, paste them within the body of the function just like that, and also import use state and use effect. And now what we can do is instead of returning JSX, we can just return data loading and error and now we've created our, our own fetch data hook that we can import into this component here just by saying data loading and error is equal to use fetch data. Call that as a function. And now when we render out a data or loading or error or anything in this particular component, it's just going to be so much neater. And our data from that particular fetch is just saved within its own nice and neat hook and it's going to come ensure our components stay nice and neat and clean. And just like that, we've gone over the six anti-patterns that will help you code like a pro instead of like a junior. I hope you've learned something. And if you have, don't forget to like and sub. Super appreciate it. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.